The World Health Organization says there is no safe amount of alcohol. Beer is typically high in calories and carbs with not much micronutrient content. So should we abstain from beer drinking entirely? Well, let's take a look at the latest health recommendations, understand whether a little bit misleading, and we're gonna calculate how many weeks drinking might cut from your lifespan. How bad is drinking beer for you? Let's find out. This episode is sponsored by Yakima Valley Hops. More on them in a bit. As somebody who has brewed hundreds of batches of beer, I was curious about beer's health impact. I took a 30-day experiment of beer consumption, one drink per day every day, and I didn't experience any negative effects or weight gain. But what about the longer-term implications? We're going to break this down into two components of beer, alcohol, and what we'll generously call nutrition, the carbs, calories, and everything else that makes up this beverage. And let's start with alcohol. In a 2023 report, the World Health Organization classified alcohol as a Group 1 carcinogen. This is the highest risk group, which also includes asbestos, radiation, and tobacco. So, a glass of IPA is as dangerous as exposure to radioactive waste? Well, the WHO adds that alcohol causes cancer through biological mechanisms as the compound breaks down in the body, which means that any beverage containing alcohol, regardless of its price and quality, poses a risk of developing cancer. And their conclusion, no amount of alcohol is safe for our health. Sounds pretty grim, but wait, remember those studies back in the 1990s? The French paradox that noted that despite a high fat content, the French had lower heart disease rates, attributing this to moderate red wine consumption. This led to claims that moderate alcohol intake, especially red wine, could reduce heart disease risk by up to 25%. Now, beer with its B vitamins and minerals was also seen as beneficial. However, recent analyses debunk these studies due to some pretty serious flaws in data interpretation. Researchers categorized abstainers as both lifelong non-drinkers and former drinkers who quit due to health reasons. This misclassification made moderate drinkers seem healthier. When former drinkers were reclassified, the supposed benefits of moderate alcohol largely disappeared. So, given that no level of beer consumption is deemed healthy, what guidance is there for how many beers we can drink? Well, the Canada Centre on Substance Use and Addiction recently published recommendations on weekly alcohol intake. They categorize one to two standard drinks per week as low risk, three to six drinks as moderate risk, where risks means increasing cancer risks, and seven or more drinks as high risk, banding around ailments like heart disease and stroke. And these guidelines are significantly stricter than others, such as the US National Institutes of Health definition of moderate drinking, which is two drinks or less a day for men and one drink or less a day for women. And it's, it's riled some people up. Well, come on, man, two drinks a week, what's that gonna do for you? I mean, that doesn't even get you through a day. The main point here is why are they telling me what I can drink at home? What, can I have uh, two liters of pop? What's more healthy, four beers or two liters of Coca-Cola? Now, research indicates that if you drink six drinks a week, you are 10 times more likely to die from any alcohol-related cause than somebody who drinks once or twice a week, 10 times. But hold on a minute here. That is actually a bit misleading. So. Take a look at this chart that tracks how the risk of alcohol-related health problems increases by the number of drinks consumed each day. Relative risk is clearly correlated with number of drinks. If you are knocking back 15 pints a day, this isn't good news for you. But look at the difference in health risks between zero drinks per day and one drink per day. Drinkers who consume one alcoholic beverage per day increase their risk of alcohol-related health problems, of which there are 23 from cancers to personal injury. They increased it by 0.5% compared to non-drinkers. A 0.5% relative risk increase between no drinking and one drink a day. What does that mean? It means four more people in a group of 100,000 per year will experience an alcohol-related problem. So that means if we take 100,000 people in the zero drinks category, 914 of those people can expect to experience a problem. In the one drink a day category, 
918 people out of those 100,000 will experience health problems. So when considering populations of millions of people, that's a meaningful difference. But to a given individual, the risks just aren't all that large. We can also look at this another way. How much are you shortening your lifespan through alcohol consumption? Research has shown that consuming two drinks a week amounts to less than one week of lost life on average. Consume seven alcoholic beverages a week, and that amount goes up to about two and a half months. If you're knocking back five drinks a day, you face the risk of losing on average upward of two years. Now, obviously these are statistical averages, not necessarily what you will personally experience, but put that way, moderate drinking doesn't seem all that bad. And it's certainly not something that's going to stop me brewing beer. Speaking of which, a quick word on today's sponsor, Yakima Valley Hops. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world. I'm using Yakima Valley Hops in every batch I brew. Carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic and many more. Homebrewers can select specific crop years and most hops come in 2, 8 and 16 ounce packages. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com to see everything they have to offer. Okay, so we've looked at alcohol, but what about all the carbs and the calories in a pint of beer? Well, unless the beer is marketed as low carb or low calorie, it's generally not very easy to find that information. Dana Garvez from Oregon Brew Lab explained the situation to our Brewlosophy Patreon members. On the commercial side, there are huge changes in labeling that are um, that are coming. Now, they've been saying this since 2004. The TTB has been threatening um, that uh, cans and bottles for beer will require labels um, that say things like calories and carbs and protein and your daily nutritions. Um, now, that hasn't been enacted yet. But today, labeling is all over the place. Macro beers like Corona, Guinness and Heidekun disclose some nutrition information. Bud Light is one of the first brands to move to a large label, which looks a lot like the labels required by the FDA on food packaging. It's easy to see why they're happy to do it, because American Light Lager just doesn't have a lot of anything in the way of nutrition. Or, let's be honest, much in the way of anything else either. But for other beer styles, nutrition information for consumers might be considered both a blessing and a curse. You know, as a consumer myself, I, I want to know those things, right? You want to know how many calories you're putting in your body or you want to know how many carbs. But when you actually look at beer and you look at how many calories and carbs are in a four ounce or a eight ounce pour or 12 ounce pour, uh, you stop wanting to know. Let's consider the calorie counts for some different beer styles, each in 12 fluid ounce or 350 milliliter servings. Now a session IPA like Dogfish Head Slightly Mighty will sit you back just 95 calories, even less than Bud Light. A Heineken, that's 140 calories, a Blue Moon, 170 calories, and a delicious Victory Golden Monkey comes in at 260 calories. High alcohol beers with sugary adjuncts can send values even higher. A 13% pastry stout will be closer to 360 calories. A regular old hazy IPA, a 16 ounce pint of it, you're looking at about 500 calories, which is kind of insane. You can approximate the calories in beer simply by multiplying the beer's ABV percentage by a factor of 2.5, and then multiplying that number by how many ounces the bottle holds. So a 5% beer holds about 12.5 calories per fluid ounce. A 10% beer holds nearer to 25. And if you know a beer's original gravity and a final gravity like homebrewers know, well, you can get a more precise measure. Use this formula to calculate calories from alcohol, then this formula for calories from carbohydrates, then add the two together for the total calories in a beer. But is there any redeeming nutritional content in beer? Well, there are some vitamins and minerals mixed in with all those empty calories. There's a bit of protein in there amongst other things. The content of B vitamins and minerals is a result of the beer being made from cereal grains and yeast. But just generally, beer is not a good source of micronutrients compared to fruits and vegetables or really almost anything else. You'd need to drink a lot of beer to reach your daily nutrition requirements. So how unhealthy is beer really? Well, it's relatively dense in calories and carbs. 
it has limited micronutrient content, and it contains alcohol, which has been proven to not be good for us. But we should also be wary of claims like if you drink daily, you are 10 times more likely to suffer an untimely demise, because it turns out the individual risk of moderate drinking is relatively small. While the evidence clearly shows that beer isn't a health food, it's important to put its risks into perspective. Now, if you do choose to partake in a few pints all at once, you might be interested in this method that Sam Adams founder Jim Coke claims will keep you sober. Using yogurt and yeast, you can watch that one right here. <laughs> 